Okay, so basically what we're wanting to do now is looking at the principal stresses and the max in-plane shear stress. So in a previous video, what we did is we basically took our um, shear and our um, normals uh, stresses that were like this, and we found a mathematical way to convert them so that if I'm going to rotate this, then I have like slightly different values for these. Um, and, you know, they kind of just look like this. So just like, yeah. Um, but the difference is that this has been tilted by an angle theta. And so we were able to figure out if this was in the y and x axis and this was in the y prime x prime axis, we were able to relate sigma x, um, sigma y, and tau xy to sigma x prime, sigma y prime, and tau x prime y prime. Okay, so these are all dependent upon theta. So the more I rotate it, um, the more those prime values change. So the question is, at what orientation do those shear and normal stresses maximize, I guess, or minimize? Where do they become extreme? And the answer is whenever, no, got it, anybody? Um, whenever the dd theta is zero. All right, so there, um, each of those values um, you can find when they're at a maximum is when their dd theta is zero. So that's the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the dd theta of the, um, what do you call that thing? Sigma x prime. So we wanna find the d, d theta of sigma x prime. So we want the dd theta of that, and we want to know when is that dd theta value gonna be equal to zero. So when is that gonna happen? Um, yay, the first term goes to zero, and then we're going to, um, the two thetas, that's all gonna come out, so it's gonna be, um, and I do recommend, if you're not really good at taking these kind of derivatives, pause the video and give it a shot, because um, this isn't a terribly awful one, and this will give you some practice. So um, let's see, what do we have here? So um, we've got sigma x minus sigma y, over two times cosine two theta, which is gonna become sine of two theta. It's actually gonna become minus sine of two theta times two. Okay, so the twos are gonna go away. And then plus tau x y times cosine theta times two going to zero. Okay, so I can make that a lot prettier. So I'm gonna write that. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna take this one since it's negative and the other side is zero anyway, and I'm just gonna move it over. So um, I'm going to have that, and I'm actually going to flip the order as well. Y'all figure it out. If you've made it this far, you can do algebra. Um, but I'm going to go sigma x minus sigma y times the sine of 2 theta is going to be equal to 2 tau x y cosine 2 theta. And if I divide both sides by cosine um, and divide both sides by the other thing, I can get, well, I can simplify stuff basically by getting tangent of 2 theta. So I'm gonna move this guy over here, and I'm gonna move this guy over here. Okay, so that's what just happened. Um, so sigma, uh, sorry, tangent of two theta is gonna be two tau xy over sigma x minus sigma y. Okay, and then this is gonna be a little weird, um, but I'm gonna instead, I'm gonna write it <laughs> as the tangent of two theta I'm gonna move the two to the bottom. So it's gonna be tau of xy divided by sigma x minus sigma y over two. Okay, there's a reason. <laughs> there's a reason that we're doing this. So remember that tangent is equal to the opposite over the adjacent. See, we're like going way back now. So basically what that means is the graphs look like this. Okay, so if you were gonna picture what a tangent looked like, um, uh, da, 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 da. tangent would look like this. So if I had a triangle here, the opposite side, I actually hit that really well and I didn't mean to, uh, the opposite side would be tau xy and the adjacent side, if this was theta, no, it wouldn't be theta, it'd be two theta, two theta. Um, and then the adjacent side would be sigma x minus sigma y over two, okay? So <laughs> that means 
<laughs> you're going to love me now. That means that the hypotenuse is the square root of the sum of the squares. <laughs> so the hypotenuse is tau xy squared plus sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared. <laughs> Yay! Oh man, I'm so sorry this is happening to you. Um, okay, so you've got this triangle. However, remember that tangent is positive in both this quadrant and this quadrant. So you actually have the same thing on the other side. Aren't you lucky? So you can come over here and you can draw the same thing. Where you have the two theta and you have the tau xy and you have the sigma x minus the sigma y over 2. And here you have the square root of blah. Okay? Yay. So, <laughs> since we have that... You know, because we're apparently lonely grad students when we discover this and, you know, I guess just hanging out at home. Um, we could, in addition to knowing the tangent, we were like, well, hot dog. I actually now also know the sine and the cosine of 2 theta because that's a thing that I totally care about. So the sine of 2 theta would be the opposite over the hypotenuse. And the cosine of 2 theta would be the adjacent, uh, gosh, over the hypotenuse law. Okay, so um, I'll move this guy down to make it more clear what's going on. Okay, so this is what we are so lucky to have discovered. What were we doing again? Yeah, okay, so we were trying to find the theta is where the max occurs, right? So remember how you were doing this a really, really long time ago in some kind of math class where you're like, um, like if you have, hold on, like um, you have like a parabola or something. Here, let me go over here so I don't mess up our pretty, pretty picture. But it would be like some kind of like Cal 1 problem maybe where you had this graph and, you know, it did stuff and you found the places where the DD whatever was zero. And so then when you found the location, so these were like the locations where the extrema occurred, which is what we've just done. So what we've just done is found the locations. We found the sine of two times that location, but we could inverse sine it, divide by two, and then we'd know the physical locations. And then you would use, so like if this was negative five, you would do f of negative five to get the actual value of the extrema, right? So this is like, you know, uh, like a 14 or something like that, then I would do F at 14 and that would give me the max. So 14 is not the max. So what we found is not the max. What we found is the location where the max occurs. So now what we get to do is we get to plug these values back in to our original equation for sigma X. Okay, I know, I know, I know. Control your excitement. This is, is in fact kind of amazing. So sigma X was given by this. So the reason we cared, apparently, that we had the cosine and the sine is because we needed them to plug them into here to get the actual maximum. Because before we got the location of the maximum, and now we need to find the actual maximum. Okay, so we're going to do that. Wahoo! Wahoo and wahoo. Okay, so <laughs> we've got that sigma. Do you see why I like this? Isn't this amazing? Sigma x prime. Look, this one's the same, is this location. Um, and then sigma x minus sigma y over 2. And now instead of writing um, cosine, we're going to write um, sigma x minus sigma y over 2 divided by the square root of blah. And then we've got tau x y times, instead of writing sine of 2 theta, we're going to do tau xy over the square root of blah. And I know you're super, super, super disappointed, um, but you're not going to get to watch me work all this out. <laughs> um, but I can tell you that it simplifies. So this would be like sigma x max, sigma x prime max. Um, we're actually going to denote that as sigma 1. Um, and actually, I'm going to give you a sigma 2 in a second, but I'll give you sigma 1 so sigma 1, um, the first two, the first term actually stays there. Sigma x, sigma y over 2. And then whenever you play around with the rest of it, you get plus the square root of blah. Um, the sigma x minus the sigma y 
over 2 quantity squared plus tau x y squared. Okay, so I said I was going to give you a 1 and a 2. Okay, now whenever we were doing, remember our picture? How could you forget? It was so long ago. Um, this picture here, um, we talked about how you're going to have two different sides. Um, so this is to get the sigma x. So if you wanted to get the sigma y, you'd basically, I don't want to draw it that way. That's going to be weird. Um, is it okay enough to say we took a square root so I can throw a plus or minus in front of it and it all works out? If you really want to know more, somebody can explain it to me in the comments. It's not that, it's just, I don't have a way to explain this quickly and easily. But if you want to get the other one, um, you just put a plus or minus there because you're basically just rotating the whole stupid thing um, by 90 degrees. And look, it, it all comes out. Okay. So these are what we would call the in-plane principle stresses. So sigma 1 and sigma 2, given by that equation there, um, ends up being the in-plane principle stresses. And um, we call, we always say that the sigma 1 is going to be whichever one is bigger. Okay, so whichever one is bigger, we just call that sigma 1. And also, the, the, the what is that thing called? A theta. The theta where this happens is called, um, it's called, or the, 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 the planes where this happens, like the xy, x prime, y prime plane, where it happens at theta p is called the principal planes. Let's try to say that a little bit better for you. Okay, so the xy plane where this occurs, x prime, y prime plane where this occurs, and it's going to be at that angle, so that theta p that's given by that thingy that was um, over here somewhere, this thing. So wherever this theta is, wherever this theta is, this is now our principal theta, okay? So you would find the principal theta, and um, that would tell you how much the plane was rotated, and that would also tell you what the principal, um, what the principal axis, what the principal stress. It's amazing, <laughs> okay? Now, Okay, I promise we're almost done, sort of, ish. It's, it's going to be super amazing. You're going to love it. So we've been talking about sigma x and y, or x prime, y prime, this whole time, but we've completely forgotten about the tau, okay? The good news is, is we've already done the location. So we have the location. Now we just need to find out what the value of tau is at that maximum location. So now we just need to plug in again for that tau, tau, tau x prime, y prime. So when we do that, so you know what I'm saying? So like the thing that had the, here I'll show you. so remember we had alligator eating baseball. Um, this thing right here, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna plug in that sine two theta, cosine two theta in again, and that will give me the value of the, um, of the shear stress at this principal location. So when I do that, woohoo! <laughs> We're gonna love it. So this actually is is super amazing. So I've got negative da 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 this da 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 over two. Here I'll just pause and write, and you can see what happens. So you actually end up with this here, and if you're super super clever, you can be like, hold on a second. They both have tau terms. They both have divide by two terms. They both have divide by blah terms, by root blah terms. And they both have this thing, except that this one has a plus and this one has a minus, so this value is zero. So happy. So actually, this is why we care. Because basically what happens is if we tilt this stupid, stupid, stupid piece of particle thing that doesn't really exist, at the perfect angle, the um, shear strains go away. <laughs> They're completely gone. So there you go. If we tilted our little dude um, perfectly, then we get like all of the shears cancel out. Now it's kind of like what I was trying to tell you at the beginning of the previous video if you watched it, is that like the whole goal of doing this, all this math for like the last hour has been to find this. This is like the, oh my goodness, this is like super amazing. I don't know why she looks sad. She should look happy. Wow, she's so happy. Look, she's got curly hair. I don't know why. Anyway, she's super happy because this is amazing and this is exactly what we wanted. So the idea is you can tilt this absolutely perfectly so that the um, shear stresses disappear 
and all you have are normal stresses. Now, I know that's super exciting to know, but you can actually also um, do this for shear, um, and I'll show you that. I think I might do that in a separate video because this has gotten kind of crazy. So um, in any case, this is just really, really awesome because that was kind of the whole point of what we were doing is to say, okay, is there a certain way that we can rotate this just perfectly um, so that all those stupid shear forces go away? Because now instead of having three or, yeah, three things that I have to keep track of and like lots of little, you know, I guess, well, not even really three. I mean, only three actual numbers, but all these, you know, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight arrows. I only have, no, what's even more? One, two, three, four, five, six. I can't add. Adding is hard. I'll just throw them in there for a second. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Okay. So there were eight um, arrows that I had to contend with before, and now I have to deal with four arrows. And so that actually makes life way, way, way easier.